Um, so our next speaker this afternoon is uh, Vanessa Voynick from Jump Trading, where she's an engineer, a verification engineer with 10 years experience in the world of hardware design and a newbie when it comes to the finance sector. Having previously worked in big tech companies such as Infineon, NVIDIA and Broadcom, Vanessa is now verification lead at Jump Trading after deciding in 2020 to take on the exciting challenge that comes with working in fintech. Hi, uh, I'm happy to be here and happy to see you all in person, as everyone else has mentioned as well. Um, right, so my name is Vanessa and I've been working for Jump Trading for the past couple of years. And as Mike mentioned, my background is in verification engineering in big tech companies, which means that if you were hoping that this presentation was a tutorial about trading or if I can give you any stock advice, um, I'm not qualified to do any of that. Um, so I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> uh, what I am qualified to talk about uh, though is, are some of the interesting challenges that the financial sector is actually dealing with. If you are like me and you haven't really thought about trading too much, the image that conjures up in my mind and probably some of yours is that the trading and finance industry is something like Wall Street and Wolf of Wall Street and Gordon Gecko sort of things. So I'm hoping that through this presentation I can dispel some of that myth. So to get to the bulk of why we're here, who are we? So who is Jump Trading? Jump Trading is the privately owned international trading company that, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> that specializes in algorithmic high frequency trading. We have more than a thousand employees all over the world and we are headquartered in Chicago. We have offices in London and Bristol in the UK. The name Jump Trading actually comes from the image of traders on busy trading floors that used to jump with tickets in hand in order to get their bids in first. And that's probably where you would have found our founders in the early 90s. But a lot has changed since then. So in the past 30 years, what has changed is we still trade in financial markets. We just do it as engineers. We believe that the core of our business is technology. And I can explain a little bit why that is. So to take a step back, what do we mean when we say trading? Well, if you, if you think about anything that can be bought or sold, we're most likely buying it and selling it, but so are our competitors. The extent of my trading knowledge goes into the basic rule of trading is buy low, sell high, which sounds incredibly simple, but actually it's very complex. <laughs> and I'll explain why. That's because markets and trading environments in general tend to be quite reactive to the number of players in the, in the markets that are trading at the time. They also tend to be reactive on major life and news events. Uh, think of things like pandemic and war, but also small tweets from CEOs that own <laughs> electric car companies. <laughs> so all of that rapid transition that tends to happen when volatility increases makes trading quite a competitive environment. So in order to keep an edge, we need more technological solutions. Those can take the those can take the form of algorithmic trading strategies or complex predictive models that require a huge data set in order to train and test, custom software and hardware infrastructures, and a lot of things that I cannot discuss without you all signing an NDA. However, none of this is actually new. <laughs> this has been going on for ages. Everyone has been trading for a very long time and they've all wanted to be first. My favorite anecdote about this is Paul Reuters of Reuters News fame, which in 1850 used a fleet of carrier pigeons in order to bridge the gap 
between two terminal points of the telegraph line that uh, connects two of the large trading centers in Europe, Frankfurt and Paris. When he did that, he actually managed to send important market quotations and news feeds twice as fast as the existing train line between those two points, which might be why his business is still around today. The reason I like that anecdote is because I think it shows creativity and ingenuity in approaches. I still think that's key to success today, but a lot has changed in the 21st century. So what are the things that have changed? We no longer have just two markets, we have hundreds of markets. On each of those, we have increased numbers of players in those markets and increased transactions. What does that actually mean? The fact that we trade thousands of symbols per market. When you think about a symbol, you think about things that, items that are normally traded. So things like gold, silver, oil, stocks, bonds. Um, all of these tend to be bought and sold on a market. And each of those transactions, the price of, of those transactions, the quantity of those transactions, and what exactly is bought and sold, gets encoded in messages that constantly flow to and from exchanges. All of that means that we end up with petabytes of data per day. So in order to go back to that buying low and selling high, we need to make sure that we are always constantly looking for the optimal points in which to buy and sell. That creates a very competitive space so we need fast and smart solutions in order to win. Right, so in when we think about financial applications like risk valuation, the things that we need to think about are the fact that they, re they require high performance and low latency implementations in order to sustain the high volume of data that needs to be processed. Where, where we trade, what sort of data is available to us and the environment in which we operate have significant ramifications in the sort of solution that we deploy. What that means is modeling performance in those scenarios becomes a significant challenge. So as verification engineers, in order to think about performance and optimization, we need to take a holistic view of the system in which we operate. That means looking at latency and performance hits all throughout the data path, which can be network capability, data center performance, board design, um, application software performance, CPU latencies, and everything in between. That is a huge challenge all on its own. And it's not easy to integrate all of that in neither our behavioral models nor our stimulus. But before first need to get that understanding of how latency occurs and how all the system interacts with each other. Most, most of the times we spend, as verification engineers, most of the times we spend in the realm of simulation. So we turn to our tools as verification engineers to figure out where, where we can look at performance. The first thing that comes to mind are accurate HDL models, which are good most of the times. They come in the form of a lot of commercially available simulators. Think things like Questa and Exilium and VCS and many others. Um, so we, we tend to rely on those quite heavily. There is a downside to it. Whenever you increase, and everyone in this room is probably aware of it, whenever you increase timescales or timescale precisions, the performance drops significantly. So they are a solution, but not a perfect solution. 
we, we can try other things in order to increase our verification performance. We can use synchronous models of asynchronous designs in order to increase performance. So for that, most of our most simulators will support that. We can also look, and we do also look at um, open source open source uh, um, compilers such as Verilator. In that case, we still brush up against the fact that we are dealing with large scale infrastructure and large scale designs. So all of these solutions tend to be very memory greedy. Other options um, that we can look at are mostly transaction level models. So we can look at behavioral models in C++, Python, or ARM fast models. That's if we are willing to compromise performance or accuracy. And that's not something that we're willing to do all of the time for reasons that might become apparent <laughs> later. Um, another, well, in, in all of this, there's one more component, which might be the solution to everything else. It has high performance and high accuracy, and that is emulation. Emulation moves us from the space of simulation, which runs at hundreds of hertz to the space of kilohertz, which means that then we can simulate these busy activity and complex designs. In reality though, we all know that emulation is expensive, resource intensive, and it can be tricky in, to parallelize software development in an emulator. So although fantastic, it's not necessarily a silver bullet. Why do we agonize a lot about accuracy and, and performance? The reason we agonize about this and we think a lot about it is because in trading, the most important times are the high volatility times. The times in which we have a lot of data flowing and a lot of high activity. So when we think about our benchmarking tests, what we want to do is make sure that they're accurate and representative to that. So we need to take into, it's a requirement to look at high activity on large scale, because normally these sorts of things can be broken down into smaller models or to just corner case, uh, transactions or or scenarios but it's not always possible although we do try to do that so most of the times what we need to look at are these layered approaches where we have these micro benchmarks for low level designs and then look at real life applications in which we do try to understand precisely the latencies and interactions that I've mentioned earlier in order to create our stimulus. The reason for this is because in most cases and in most companies, if a design works in the worst case scenario, then it is fit for purpose. In trading, that might not always be the case. An example of this is, again, when you have a lot of high volume of traffic, there is no control. So we don't have any control of the traffic that actually, that we engage with. Therefore, traditional design patterns like uh, back pressuring or using token mechanisms to deal with this might not always be the optimal solution because that can force us into a higher latency solution. If we lose track of the market data, we have already lost and our design is not meeting its target and achievements. Right, so as I said, we operate in 
a highly competitive space and the markets keep changing and evolving all the time. We can guard against this sometimes. So we can, in some instances, kind of predict some of the problems that might arise. For instance, when markets change their encoding of messages, they switch from ASCII to binary or so on. But those aren't the interesting challenges that we have to deal with. The most interesting challenges that we have to deal with are the fact that in different markets and different exchanges, each of them has a slightly different flavor and they operate slightly differently. You can never predict what the competition is doing. Uh, so that has a huge impact. You can be on top of the world today and your solution might not work tomorrow. That means that we live in this world of perpetual innovation and this perpetual startup culture in which the challenges that we face today and the problems that we're trying to face today might not be the same as the ones the day before. Now, all of that means that this is a pure technological challenge. We have no marketing, no costing, no support, and no branding to hide behind. It's just problem solving in its purest form. That can sometimes feel scary and overwhelming, <laughs> um, but there is an upshot to the fact that there are fast moving markets in this fast moving space. And the upshot of that is that your work and the results of your work are almost instantaneously visible. You just need to know where to look. So with that, I hope that gives you an idea of what we do. Um, we are around and we have a stall in the lobby, so feel free to come up to us and ask us questions. We will do our best to answer them, uh, but we're not making any promises that you don't have to sign an NDA. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a little bit scared to ask some of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll My plan has worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you able to tell us anything about the types of um, modeling techniques do you, you do use, and which ones you find acceptable? We use so everything that I've mentioned. We use all of them. Okay. So we use almost. All of them we try to use as many as possible and we tried we constantly try to look at innovative ways of of using them and piecing them together in order to kind of understand where the largest gains are and when where to optimize okay and um apologies to some of our sponsors but on the revelator where does the sort of revelator fit in the uh, in the portfolio of simulators that you use? It's, it's one of the options that we have. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's all I'm going to say. We do, we do use it, but we use many of the others. Probably okay. all of the ones that are sponsoring today. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. And emulation, or are you not allowed to say? Yes, we are. <laughs> okay. And the FPGA prototyping is the other one. Do you do any FPGA prototyping? Is it all done on emulation? I cannot answer that. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm stopping asking these questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.